Okay, I'm, if we're ready to go, I'm ready to go. Yep. Yeah? All right, very good. My voice might be a little bit better than yesterday. I'm slowly coming out of the frogman stage, not quite. I need to give the introduction to get the caveat that my employer insists I give when I go out to give talks. My name's Les Johnson. I am a physicist, a uh, graduate of Vanderbilt, did my graduate work here in Nashville, Vanderbilt. I currently live in Huntsville, where I work for NASA at the Marshall Space Flight Center, where I'm the uh, uh, senior technical advisor to the Advanced Concepts Office. And yeah, it's actually as cool as it sounds. I, I really enjoy what I do. And in my career, and outside of my career, I have made solar sail technology kind of the focus, if I had to pick a focus of what I do during my day job, as well as a focus of advocacy outside of work. And what I'll be talking to you today about is solar sail technology. I'm, I'm gonna give you a quick overview of what it is. If you heard my interstellar talk last night, just consider that part of review. And then I'm gonna tell you what it's good for, what they can do, and what they enable far earlier than they'll enable us to go to the stars. This is a technology that's going to let us do things robotically, primarily with robotic spacecraft, small spacecraft, not humans, that we just can't do any other way. And it's a technology that has gone from science fiction of 25 years ago to reality today. And I'll talk you through a little bit of that history as we go forward. Here's all my social contact information. I enjoy hearing from people. If you have feedback about my books or my talks, please let me know. I do have a table in the back where a friend of mine is uh, selling copies of some of my popular science books, as well as my science fiction. And a lot of what I'm talking about today can be found in my book, Solar Sails, which I wrote uh, with uh, one of the leading European experts on solar sails, a fellow named Giovanni Volpetti. And just as a quick aside, which sounds like a homeless, shameless plug for a book, but I'm going to tell you anyway, because professionally, it was kind of exciting to me. I'm a scientist. I'm a physicist. I'm not a Nobel laureate. I'm not one of the, and this is, this is not self-deprecation, this is just an honest assessment of my ability as a physicist. The caliber of my work is not going to get published in the two journals, Science or Nature. I mean, those are like the primo journals where Nobel laureates publish, where directors at Columbia publish, that kind of thing. My work's not of that caliber. But I did get in Nature, because Nature Magazine reviewed our solar sail book and put it on their must-read list for popular science books. It's not a textbook. Yeah, I was really excited. I've got that framed, actually, that issue of nature. And I was so excited about it, I went home to tell my wife. And she said, Les, I've heard of nature, but why are you so excited about this? And I said, Carol, this is like Oprah's list for geeks. I mean, it's just, it's, it, it is it, you know, to be on that book list. But that's, that's this book here. But let me tell you about solar sails. What are they? Well. And I promised last night I'd bring a sample, and I'll pass it around, and you can, you can feel it. It is pretty robust, but I'm not going to challenge you to try to tear it, because you can if you try. But just holding on to it and passing it around, you're probably not going to damage it, okay? This material is a polyimid. It's a plastic. It's got 100 angstroms of aluminum on both sides. It's three microns thick. If you keep up with dimensions, that's for those of you that aren't follically challenged, that's about the size of a hair, maybe a little bit less than the dimensions of your hair. And if you put this out in space, it's got over 90% reflectivity of most of the solar spectrum. Light will reflect from it. And what that will do is that will push on. Light has no rest mass, but it does have momentum. We've known this for about 100 years, okay? Satellites in space right now have to contend with this constant push and actually have to correct their trajectories, or what's called their attitude, which is the way they point, because the solar pressure is very small. It's on the order of an ounce per football field, okay? But over time, it, it adds up, right? So what will happen is sails attached to a small spacecraft will experience an acceleration. The only formula I'm gonna use is F equal MA. Force is mass times acceleration. The solar force at, Earth, at the distance from the sun is constant. So to get an acceleration that's large, you want a low mass, right? So you want to make your spacecraft and your sail system as light a weight as possible. That's why we make it out of very thin materials and very lightweight materials, is this small push to get the acceleration on the spacecraft. Your spacecraft has to be lightweight. A question I'm always asked, and it's okay if you want to ask it again, even though I'm going to explain it. I get it every time. 
So I try to short circuit it. As less, that's great for moving away from the sun. I understand how if the sun's over there and I put out the sail and the light reflects from it, you move away from the sun. It turns out solar sails are actually performing better to take spacecraft toward the sun. So you're going to say, how do you do that? Well, people tend to forget is that the Earth is in orbit around the sun. We have an orbital period of 365 and one quarter days. So if you leap off the Earth in your rocket ship, you are still in orbit around the sun. This mic is the sun. You're in orbit around it. Okay. So your spacecraft with your sail is in orbit around it. You deploy the solar sail, if you're like this, the push will push you outward while you're moving around. So you will spiral out from the sun. If you tilt your sail and change the angle of reflection, do you remember your freshman year of physics if you took that, or in high school took physics, you remember how to add up forces. And what that means is you change the net force acting on the sail, and you can actually have a component of the sun's thrust acting along the way you're already moving. What does that do? It speeds you up. If you tilt the sail the other way, it slows you down. By tipping and tilting the sail, you can spiral in or out from the sun. So you can actually spiral in very close to the sun. And as you get closer, there's more light falling on the sail, so the thrust gets larger and the sail performs better. As you move out from the sun, the sun gets dimmer and the less thrust you get because you have less light falling on the sail. So now you know how solar sails navigate. It's all about reflecting as much light as you can and being able to control the orientation of your sail relative to the sun. You want to pass that around so people can feel it? Now, just covered that. This is showing that if you, if you remember and hated doing blocks sliding down planes and you were wondering why in the world do I have to waste my time adding up forces on wooden blocks falling down inclined planes, it's because when you're flying a solar sail you need to know how to do that. Okay? So you add up the forces and you can get a net thrust along your velocity vector or anti-parallel to it to accelerate or decelerate. Solar sails have a pretty long history. Maxwell, when he formulated the laws of electromagnetism, which is near and dear to everything you guys do, if he had known that we would be flying in space out in vacuum, you can derive the thrust of solar sails from Maxwell's equations. Okay? So he didn't do that. He could have. It's just something he did. The first known writings about solar sails are attributed to two Russians, Konstantin Tsiolkovsky and Friedrich Sander. They are the ones that said, you know, this ought to work for moving around in space. People ought to do this sometime. But they were ahead of Robert Goddard and Von Braun and Rocketry, and they kind of overlapped a little bit in the latter part of their lives with it, but never saw it realized. The first measurement of solar photon pressure in space was done in 1964. The U.S. flew this big balloon, big mylar balloon in Earth orbit. There's a neat video online where there was actually a camera on the rocket that kicked the balloon off the little package, and you can see this thing inflate. You can see the people standing down here and how big this balloon is. This was just to measure aerodynamic drag, but they were also able, based on how its orbit decayed from radar signatures, they figured out what the forces were acting on it to bring it in, and they were able to pull out and figure out how much thrust it was getting from the sunlight that was reflected off this big aluminized mylar balloon. So that was the first measurement in space of solar photon pressure. Since then, it's actually been used, but not as a primary propulsion system. Back in the 70s, there was a mission going to Mercury, it was one of the Mariner missions, that had a malfunction. And the Star Tracker locked onto a piece of debris and thought it was the star it was supposed to use to navigate. And so the spacecraft kept changing the way it was pointing. And they burned up all of their uh, attitude control fuel, their extra fuel to keep the spacecraft stabilized. What the guys did uh, in mission control is they said, well, let's use the pressure of sunlight and how a little bit we can gimbal these solar arrays to keep the spacecraft level so it doesn't tumble out of control. They did that. And they successfully completed the mission by using sunlight pressure to keep the spacecraft balanced so they wouldn't start tumbling and not be able to complete its mission. So that was one of the first uses in space of solar photon pressure to, to maintain 
a spacecraft. The, the modern era of solar sailing was really in the 90s. A group of Russians said, you know, comrade, this was back in the, began really in the Soviet days and ended up flying in the Russian days. They said, you know, comrade, we've got a real problem in Siberia. Those long, long nights, I can't do a Russian accent or I'd be trying. Those long, long nights lead people to be depressed and drink lots and lots of alcohol, and our economic output is hurt by that. So what we need to do is we need to put big mirrors in orbit, reflect sunlight down on those long Siberian nights so that our people won't drink so much vodka and they'll be more productive. And lo and behold, the Soviet Russian Apalachik bought it, and so they flew Zanamya. After they had a spacecraft undocked from their Mir space station, they deployed a rotating sail. It was a, a, a film like mylar, it was aluminized. It deployed outward from the centrifugal force of the rotation, kept it stabilized, reflected light down on the ground, and they had ground stations set up to measure the little bit of light. You would barely notice it. It was in orbit, it was moving very fast. If you were standing where it was and you were in complete darkness, you might have noticed something, probably not. But their instruments detected it. They went back, they said, comrades, this worked great, let's do it again and do a bigger one. So they flew another mission. When they deployed the sail, there was an antenna on the spacecraft that was supposed to retract before they deployed the sail. It did not retract. So as the sail deployed, it was shredded. Now we've since learned that the team that did this did never believe that they would be lighting up Siberia at night. That was what they had to tell the politicians to get funded, okay? They were trying to build a solar sail because they wanted to demonstrate the capability of using sailing in space and being good members of the bureaucracy, they figured out how to work the bureaucracy to get to do what they wanted to do, okay? So that was the first real space demonstration. They didn't, they didn't actually measure the acceleration or the thrust, it was a deployment demo which is important. You gotta demonstrate the technology one step at a time. Pretty cool. Following that, the Germans said, we are gonna fly a solar sail. So in the late 90s, they built this ground demonstrator. And this is important because a few years later, on a project that I managed for NASA, and remember, I'm speaking as a private citizen here. I'm not speaking representing NASA. If you're tweeting, don't say NASA guy said this. Say Les Johnson author of science and science fiction said that, but not NASA guy, all right? So there is a, uh, uh, this spacecraft demonstrator, it was a model, they deployed a 20 meter by 20 meter, so 20 meters on a side, which translates into about 100 feet across, sail, they didn't do it in vacuum, they just wanted to see if they could package it and get it to autonomously deploy. They used composite booms, which is pretty good for the late 90s, okay, they were kind of heavy, by today's standards, but they had composite booms. And this is the team looking at their success. This was done, I love the name of the town, Oberfaffenhofen. <laughs> Say that a few times, and you'll, you'll feel like you're, you're a German, right? It's just wonderful. You talk about talking to the Germans about going to their mission operations center, and you just hear Oberfaffenhofen roll right off your lips. It's wonderful. Um, I've been there, it's a pretty cool place. It's the uh, German operations center. But anyway, they did this deployment. They were gonna do a mission called Odyssey, and they proposed it, it wasn't selected, and the European Space Agency and the German Space Agency basically said, we're not doing sales, go away. So, at about that time, um, my career changed. I was at uh, NASA Marshall working in the Advanced Space Transportation Program. I was, uh, I was a principal investigator, a scientist, for an experiment using something called a space tether, which I've got a whole other talk I can talk to you about. And I was working that, and uh, I was in another office, and I got recruited to come to this office because they were funding it. And they said, you might as well be working it for where we're funding it instead of your other job. And I was in a meeting at Marshall with a bunch of rocket jockeys. And I say it that way for a reason. The Marshall Space Flight Center builds big rockets. Most of the people there are aerospace engineers. I'm a little weird. I'm a physicist, okay? They're aerospace engineers, mechanical engineers, whatever. And they are thinking about space shuttle main engines, big thrust, big rockets, all right? So, at this time, the NASA administrator had gone to JPL, who's known for doing deep space missions, and had challenged them to come up with a propulsion system to do a, mi a mission I mentioned last night called Interstellar Probe, which would go out further and faster than Voyager, and to do it in the near term. 
And he said, and I want you to go talk to the guys at, at Marshall, because I'm paying those people to do propulsion work, to work on this. So the request came to our group for somebody to go support JPL in looking at the interstellar probe. Well, you can't do this with a rocket. There's no way you can get those speeds and distances with rockets. And I was in the room with my colleagues who were really smart people who basically laughed at this. So that's ridiculous. Why would anybody want to go do that? Ha, ha, ha. Who's going to be stuck with that? And I'm sitting there thinking, that sounds really cool. Sign me up, right? So I raised my hand, and everyone was relieved. Great, it's the new guy. He's the guy who's talking about pushing spacecraft with a wire. He can go do that. So I worked with JPL for a few years on that, and ultimately that led to a project. And I've got a whole other story about how that happened. Um, yeah, I'll tell you. Um, I, uh, I had, the, in this interstellar probe thing, one of the things that happened is we had a deadline. And that deadline was to come up with a story of how we would do it, not only the propulsion, but the communications, the spacecraft. JPL had the lead for all of it except the propulsion. I was the propulsion guy. So the administrator called and said, I want that team to meet me at, at Y River. Now, Y River is in Maryland, I think, and it's, it's kind of an executive retreat for Washington uh, bureaucrats and congressmen and everything else. Pretty nice place. So we were flown up to Y River for two days, and we had a, like a whole day with the administrator of NASA. And at this time, I'm a mid-level guy at Marshall. You know, I, I was just in awe. I'm going to talk to the big cheese, right? The guy that's, that's, that's appointed by the president. So I go in, and everybody's briefing, and I give the briefing on a solar sail and nuclear electric propulsion and different advanced propulsion that we looked at and why we selected solar sails. And he started asking me about the other propulsion ideas, too. Well, what is that good for? What is that good for? And I told him. And he said, okay. So that's all I'm fine. About a month later, on a Friday afternoon, yes, sir? Was that Dan Golden? It was Dan Golden. Mm -hmm. On a Friday afternoon, I'm at my desk. Now remember, I'm not a senior guy. Today I'm the senior technical advisor for the Advanced Concepts Office. At that time, I was just a guy in the queue, all right, who got a really cool assignment, right? But it was a guy in the queue. So my phone rings. This is Les. I get, this is XYZ, I won't say the name. I'll say Joe Bob at the Office of Management and Budget. And I'm thinking, wrong number, right? <laughs> yeah. So I said, okay. And he said, I want to tell you, I want to find out from you basically some information about this project you're going to be managing. And I said, excuse me? And he said, well, we have a note from the NASA administrator that I'm supposed to put in the budget a $40 million a year project for you to manage starting next year. And I said, I don't know anything about this. And he said, well, you're not supposed to. It's all embargoed. It's part of the president's budget coming up. And that's why I'm calling you. I need some information. <laughs> Friday afternoon, 4 o'clock. So I'm sitting there thinking, well, can I talk to my boss and maybe get some insight? Because I have no idea. And he said, oh, no, you can't do that. This is all embargoed. I need it from you. And I said, well, OK, I have some ideas. Great. When can you get it to me? Well, how soon do you need it? Well, this weekend. And I said, well. Forty million a year, I'll do that. <laughs> so, and I said, "Is there anybody I can tell?" And he said, "Yes, you can tell your center director." So I had to skip three levels of management. Wow. Okay. Yeah. So I sit down. Early email, right? This is the you know this is right around the year two thousand or so. So I type out this email. Hello, Mr. Center Director. You don't know me, but I just got called from so and so at OMB about a project I'm apparently managing next year. And I thought I needed to tell somebody, and they said, the only person I can tell is you. What do you want me to do? And he wrote me back saying, basically, don't worry about it. I've got your back. Tell them whatever they need. Go. Whoa. So for the next four years, I got to manage this project. And as a part of this project, what we developed was a big, among many other things. We worked on electric propulsion, aero capture, all kinds of stuff. I could give a talk on all those. I could talk all day sure. if I weren't going to get hoarse. Uh, and we developed two big solar sails. So what you see here are pictures taken from the top of the world's biggest vacuum chamber, which is in Sandusky, Ohio, all right? Don't ask me why Sandusky. I have no idea. Probably an influential Politics. congressman or senator at some point, all right? Politics. Politics somehow. I don't know. But it's the world's biggest vacuum chamber. You go into this place, it's like, uh, it's just enormous, okay? They can pump this down to the vacuum that the shuttle experiences or spacecraft, space station experiences. It's incredible, the vacuum pumps. 
So what we did is we paid two companies to come up with competing designs for a solar sail and said that in order to basically meet the requirements, you had to survive testing under vacuum conditions and under the temperature extremes that you'll encounter in space. And it all has to deploy autonomously, and it has to have certain, remember I talked about it has to be lightweight. We gave them weight targets, what it had to be. So these are two different technologies of solar sails that were deployed. The one on the right used a, a mechanical boom. Just think about a sailing ship. I mean, it was a boom to move it around. They had pulleys and wires and everything else there. The team on the left said that's too heavy. We're going to use this interesting material that you inflate like a balloon. And you can inflate it straight. And when it gets cold, it becomes rigid so the gas can leak away. And it makes a really lightweight boom. So an inflatable system versus a mechanical system. They went through all this work. Both of them tested. Both of them worked. These sails were 100 feet in diameter. And both of them deployed from a box smaller than half this podium. Really small. Incredible. 50 foot booms. Four of them in each box half the size of this podium. Really amazing work. Well, what happened after that is it was decided that NASA was going to focus its efforts on going back to the moon. Remember that? Yeah. yeah. And all of the technology money was pulled and canceled. So the program was canceled. Uh, we had a flight test planned, and we did not get to fly it. All right. So what happened? In that same time period, any members of the Planetary Society here? Anybody know of the Planetary Society? Private space advocacy group headed up now by Bill Nye, the science guy. At the time, it was Luke Friedman, who was the head of it. So they decided to build the world's first solar sail, and they're going to do it all privately, all private funds. So they hit all the membership up. They got some sponsors. They got some money. They built a solar sail. They said, man, this launch is expensive. NASA stalled out on what they're doing. Germany's quit doing it. Russia's quit doing it. By golly, we're going to do it. We want these to happen. So they built their sail with the Russians, and they said, we need to get to space. And the Russians, with typical Russian accent, right, I still can't do it, came in and said, hey, we got a deal for you. Yeah. We are converting our, our submarine-launched ballistic missiles to be rockets to carry commercial payloads to space. Pay us a cheap rubles, very few, and we will fly your payload to space. So the Planetary Society, I mean, that, that's all they could afford, right? I don't blame them for that. So they give their hardware, they get it to the Russians, the Russians launch it, whoosh, splash, right in the ocean. The Planetary Society, um, uh, I went all the way to the beginning, let me, I'm sorry, let me get back where I was. The Planetary Society had a flight spirit, which is going to be important in a minute too. So they said, okay, let's try again. The Russians came back and said, you know, we figured out what went wrong. We'll do it again. Pay us some money and we'll fly it again. Give you a great deal. We know what we did wrong. We feel bad for you. Pay them the money. Boom. Back down in the ocean. That was it for Cosmos 1. They didn't, they stopped the program. They have come back since with something called light sail, which I'll talk about in a few minutes. And they are not going to the Russians. <laughs> We're going to India. <laughs> not a stop um, anyway. So I mentioned these big solar sails that we were developing. Well, this sail on the right, uh, I'm going to walk away from the mic for a second. This is called a quadrant. There are four of them, right? Quadrant. That's one quadrant. We had a little bit of money left over when this program was canceled, and we had this hardware. So we couldn't afford to fly a big spacecraft with this big sail. We said, what can we do? We said, well, let's use one of these newfangled CubeSats, which are these little three they're 10 centimeter by 10 centimeter, 10 centimeter cubes that, that are modular that are mostly used by universities. They're for very low cost space flight. A 3U CubeSat means it's 30 centimeters. It's about the size of a loaf of bread, okay? So what we did is we cut up one of those quadrants and made this sail here, which is about three and a half meters on the side instead of 20. It's got four booms deployed from the middle of the CubeSat. And we said, we want to fly this in space as a demonstration of deployment. Well, it did. Um, it flew on one of the test flights of the Falcon 1. Whoosh, boom, <laughs> crash. Okay? You can tell the solar sails have a little bit of bad luck getting to space at this point, right? So what we did is we had a flight spare. Oh. <laughs> so we went to another spacecraft, which was a DOD mission called FastSat. And we convinced them to put a little deployer on that satellite so that it would kick off the nano-CLD in space and fly. Well, FASTSAT reached orbit, 
It was time for the nanosat nanosail to deploy. Nothing happened. It did not deploy. The team looked at it, tried to figure out what went wrong. Couldn't figure out what went wrong. Basically said, we have no idea. So kind of forgot about it. It's FastSat did its business. And then about three months later, FastSat experienced an anomaly. Something uh -oh. funny happened. The spacecraft went bump. Uh-oh. Okay? And so the flight team was trying to figure out, you know, in space, there aren't many things that can act on this. What would cause a spacecraft like this to go bump? It's still functioning. Was it hit by debris? Did so What happened? And one of our team, it wasn't me, I wish it was me, wasn't me, raised her hand and said, you know, this looks exactly like the acceleration we would have expected if our nanosat with nanosail had, had, had lifted off on, on time and had kicked out of it because there's a spring to push it out. And the vibration looks just like what we were expecting. And they said, quick, turn on the radio. Because the transmitter only had power for like three days, all right? So the team frantically, you know, yeah. dusts off everything. Like the freak. The freak. Yeah, really, quickly, <laughs> get, us, you know, get us, turn on these receivers. Lo and behold, the satellite called help. Uh, it deployed, fantastic. and we were able to get ground-based photographs from amateur astronomers of the sail as it, as it was deployed in space. It's my understanding, and I haven't seen it, that certain three-letter agencies got some really beautiful pictures of our spacecraft. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I have not been pretty to see those pictures. From the black ground. I would really like to see them. Yeah. Well, at about the same time we were flying NanoSail D, the Japanese, acting in pretty, pretty secret, flew Icarus. And last night I made a joke about the name Icarus, right? If you remember your mythology, Icarus got a little close to, close, too close to the sun and came to a bad end. Yes. Well, the Japanese Icarus, I guess they did this to redeem Icarus, uh, they flew on a mission that went to Venus uh, as a secondary payload, and they kicked off, and they deployed a 14-meter by 14-meter rotationally stabilized solar sail that is still flying today. They are the first people to demonstrate interplanetary solar sailing using a sail for primary propulsion. They did it first. They started after we quit yeah. and just went and did it. And not only did they do it, they are really elegant in how they did it. Their sail has no booms. It slowly rotates to be deployed, so it's very lightweight. It doesn't have separate solar arrays to generate power. They took thin film photovoltaics and embedded them in the sail wow. to generate power from within the sail. And they don't have anything mechanical to tip and tilt the sail. Everything we've been looking at was some kind of mechanical system of moving mass to tip or tilt the sail. What they did is they coated some of the sail with an electrochromic coating, okay. yes. which means you put a voltage across it and it makes it dark. Yep. When you don't reflect as much light on part of your sail, you get half the thrust. That's right. And if you're only pushing on this half of the sail, the part you're pushing stronger on is going to tilt away from it. Yep. So they do all of their steering solid state. Pretty incredible. Uh, yes, I'm insanely jealous. Okay. <laughs> um, they beat us to it. Just awesome engineering. Brilliant, and they have another mission plan that's going to go to Jupiter using a solar sail very soon. Well, that here's a picture, uh, a series of pictures taken from Icaros around Venus, near Venus. These selfies were taken by a little miniature spacecraft with essentially a cell phone camera in it that was kicked off the mothership to look at the integrity of the sail as it moved away, had a low power transmitter that sent the signal back to the mothership, and then the mothership sent the data back home. So we have this still picture images of Icarus rubbing the American noses in the dirt <laughs> and having beaten us to it. So what are we doing? We have some planned demonstrations and actual missions. You may have heard about the cancellation of a project called Sunjammer, which was a big solar sail that was supposed to be flown in the next few years. I really can't comment on that because I would be abusing my fact that I'm not here speaking for NASA. Just read the Space News article about it, and you'll, you'll learn all I can really say about the cancellation of Project Sunjammer. The good thing is that there are two other projects uh, that are being developed, that are funded, that we're working on in Huntsville, uh, called Near Earth Asteroid Scout and Lunar Flashlight, that are going to fly solar sails on, on, on not as a demo, because we believe it's already been demonstrated. We're going to go to two destinations using solar sails deployed from these CubeSats. At the same time we're doing that, the Planetary Society, based on NASA's NanoSail D and their experiences with the failed Cosmos 1 and 2, have built a 3U CubeSat with LightSail 1 and LightSail 2. Their sail's bigger, it's about 32 square meters, ours was 10. They're going to fly, again, with all private money. 
They have a flight next April, and then a flight a year after that, not on a Russian rocket. Okay. <laughs> so these are being. This first one is built. It's undergone testing. We have an agreement with them. They're sharing data with us, and we're working together. Someone last night asked about how we're collaborating. We are working with the Planetary Society informally uh, in terms of the uh, sharing of information about the technology. There was another CubeSat sail that we use a long, thin sail uh, at CU Aerospace and the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. That hardware is finished and is awaiting funding from somebody. We haven't been able to find the funds yet uh, for flight. So if anybody happens to be a venture capitalist millionaire who wants to fund solar sail flights, I can tell you to go talk to at UIUC and uh, CU Aerospace for flying this. The Europeans, also kicked in the tail by the Japanese, and seeing what we're doing, have said, we want back in the game. So they have planned and funded three solar sail flights, starting like we are with CubeSats, and working way up to bigger and bigger sails. So they have three of them. Gossamer 1 is complete, and I believe it's going to fly on a mission called QB50, which is a European launch. It's going to happen in about a year. Gossamer 2 is a little bit bigger, and Gossamer 3 will be a 50 meter sail by 50 meters, and they're working on that now. It's pretty big, pretty ambitious. Also in Europe, there are three small solar sails being developed at the University of Surrey in the UK, and I'm the American co-investigator on inflate sail, which will use these inflatable booms, but on, not on the scale that we did with Sunjammer, but on a cube sail. Just looking at different technologies for deploying sails. Uh, these are the partners with that, and the Surrey Space Center in the UK is the lead for this. But what are the missions that are happening in the near term? Well, I'm the PI for something called Near Earth Asteroid Scout. We're working with JPL. JPL's building the spacecraft bus because they do interplanetary spacecraft for NASA. It's going to be a 6U CubeSat instead of a 3. We're building the solar sail on the lead, and it's going to be an 85 square meter sail deployed from a spacecraft the size of two loaves of bread. To give you an idea of what 85 square meters is, it's about the floor area of this room. Okay? Uh, the whole spacecraft's going to weigh about 20 pounds, total weight. So we're going to deploy this. It's going to be on Earth escape and deployment. Doesn't have to leave the atmosphere. A rocket's going to take it up, shoot it out into deep space. It'll take us about two years to reach the asteroid. But the beautiful thing about this on a solar sail is you don't have any fuel. All of our acceleration is derived from reflecting light. What that means is, as long as the sun shines and the spacecraft keeps working, we can go anywhere we want to go. There is no other propulsion system that you could package in such a small space to do this mission. The propulsion requirements are too intense. Chemical can't do it. Electric propulsion, which I talked about yesterday, can't do it. The only way to do that is the continuous low thrust of the solar sail. So here's what the concept of operations looks like. We're going to launch. We're going to fly by the moon. The sail will deploy. We're going to do a few more loops around the moon. And the reason we're looping around the moon is we're waiting on the asteroid to come in to where it needs to be for us to get to it. So the length of time we loop around the moon will be determined by when we actually launch. And we have to wait for this asteroid that we want to go visit to come into the right place so that we can fly and do a slow rendezvous with it. So we're not using that for gravity assist? Uh, the moon is going to give us a little bit of a gravity assist, not a whole lot. Uh, we're going to have to actually uh, capture into a, a lunar, highly elliptical lunar orbit, and we're basically going to hang out there for a while, and then we're going to fly out of lunar gravity and go on. Uh, if we were doing a lunar gravity assist, we could, and you know if our launch date shifts, we, we might be able to have shorter trip time doing lunar gravity assist, but our customer has only a few, and this is a NASA customer, internal the agency, has given us a list of asteroids they're interested in. So it's not just you know, any asteroid. We have certain ones that they want us to go look at. I, I'd be happy with any of them, right? But they have what they want looked at. So we have to wait for the one they want us to see to get where we can get to it with the propulsion system. And, and what's, what's neat about this is the mission will be considered a complete success after we do that. But I've got a functioning spacecraft that can still go places with a camera on board and a communication system. The extended mission that I want to propose, if we're successful on the primary mission, basically go to another asteroid. I've also got a plan, and I've done the math, that says, you know, we might be able to put this on a close solar pass. Not real close, because the spacecraft couldn't survive it, but close enough to get a little bit of a gravity assist from the sun. 
and WCIP's chief solar system escape. And so I'm actually contemplating and talked about with the, uh, my management team, I'm, I'm the chief scientist, not the project manager, getting a little container with uh, hair samples, if I, well, I still have some, um, <laughs> of all members of the team on board this and, and send our DNA to the stars. It's what I'd like to do at the end of this. So I'm a dreamer, folks, um, and that's kind of my dream. Yes? How far out can this, can it still function electric? Uh, we will, if you do this, the sail, for all intent and purposes, won't get much thrust out to past the asteroid belt, partway to Jupiter, because it's such a small sail. Yeah. And the spacecraft will stop functioning then, because it won't have power. Um, but that's okay. The yeah. secondary mission, after we do the asteroid mission, is really just because we can. Okay? And I don't know about y'all, but I, I kind of like to cool that. I think that'd be kind of cool. So, that's, that's not official. That's just something that I'm talking about. It, it is official that we're going to an asteroid. Teach our kids about the alert. It could be a third vehicle to leave the solar system. It could be. Voyagers 1 and 2, and it could be us. Uh, actually, uh, New Horizons will also leave, the one that's going to Pluto. Okay? Uh, if, you, if you Google this, you can find a couple of papers we've written about Neosco. Yes? Is there any other proposal that can help it out of the moon orbit? No. So it's all. So we're saying, we have an onboard cold gas system because as soon as the launch vehicle kicks us off, we're going to be tumbling, and we can't deploy the sail while we're tumbling. So we have a little bit of cold gas to stop it and stabilize it. Then we deploy the sail, and the sail does the propulsion from that point forward. Now there's another mission that's a sister mission that's not a Marshall mission. It's led by JPL. It's going to use the same solar sail, so we're building the sail for it. It's called Lunar Flashlight. Lunar Flashlight funded mission is going to go to the moon. Oops. You illuminate the, the dark side of the moon? No, well, there is no dark side of the moon. Oh. There is a far side of the moon, yes. And it can experience day and night. We have Pink Floyd to thank or curse yes. <laughs> for that. Okay, a lot of people say that, but there's a far side that we don't see from here, but we've seen the far side. What we haven't seen is at the south pole, since the moon doesn't have the axial tilt the Earth does, there are craters at the south pole of the moon that have never had sunlight in. And the moon shares the same impact history of the Earth. Just look at the moon. And our water came from comets hitting the Earth. Well, if a comet hits the surface of the moon and gets hit with sunlight, the water is going to evaporate, sublimate. It's going to go away. But those big craters should have ice in them because they haven't had anything above a little bit above absolute zero for about a billion years or more. All right? So lunar flashlight is going to go into a lunar polar orbit. They're going to use the solar sail to decrease the perilune, the periapsis of the orbit, the, the close point of the orbit, over the South Pole, to less than 20 kilometers, 12 miles. That's not that far. Big picture. And when they're going over, they're going to use the sail to reflect light into the crater and take pictures. Okay? That's lunar flashlight. That's also an approved mission. You can read about that online. You can use solar sails to help give advanced warning to the solar storms that I talked about yesterday and are covered in my book, Sky Alert, When Satellites Fail. Solar storms are the kind of things that can knock out our satellites and wreak havoc with things here. It's part of the space weather program. And scientists are interested in having more warning. Well, you can use a solar sail to take a spacecraft closer to the sun and thrust continuously so it always stays between us and the sun. A conventional spacecraft going that close, at times, will be on the other side of the sun because it's in a different orbit. So the only way you'd have continuous observation of these storms closer to the sun than the Earth is to have a whole fleet of these spacecraft, or one, using a solar sail. That's not planned, but it is something that can happen in the future. Another potential mission is something called a pulsar. Right now we have geosynchronous satellites in Earth orbit at the geo at geosynchronous orbit. They're not really hovering, they're just orbiting the Earth with the same period that the Earth rotates, so it looks like they're motionless. With a sail hovering above the Earth, you can counter the pull of the Earth's gravity and literally float in space above the Earth's pole as the Earth orbits the sun. And you can use that with instruments then to study the polar regions at either the north or the south pole. Another mission that's possible but not that yet. Yeah. In addition to asteroids, you can do this to follow a comet and the complete life cycle of a comet. We can do this to do interesting maneuvers with uh, looking at the different sides of the sun. And yesterday I gave a whole talk on how we might be able to use solar sails to actually take us to another star someday. 
And that's, that's, that you get back to why I'm into solar sales, okay? Solar sales are a great capability for the near term. I love interplanetary travel. I want to see humanity go to the stars. And I think this is one of those technologies that 200 years from now, we might be able to big sail, build sails the size of Texas and actually send spacecraft to another star. We don't know how to do that today, but we're taking the first baby steps to get there. How fast would such a sail go? Roughly, I mean. Really fast. Um, <laughs> uh, 10 AU per year. An astronomical unit's 93 million miles, okay? Uh, Voyager's not traveling anywhere close to that. It's traveling at almost a million miles a day. We would go probably 10 times faster than that. Close to 10 million miles a day. Think about watching that go by, okay? Fortunately, space is big and mostly empty. You're putting so, rocket scientists out of work. Uh, yeah, that's. I, I would. I would like to have a whole bunch of solar sail scientists. Working what's there, right? What's the problem with scaling it up that big? Where, where is the? Where does it break down? Well, where it breaks down right now is the material science. That you need to take that five micron sail or four micron one that I passed around, which I hope to get back, by the way. Um, I don't know where it is, but if you can pass it on up, right. it never made it here. It never, never made it there. If you've got that piece of uh, solar sail, keep passing it around. We, we need to get down to something that's about a tenth to a twentieth the thickness of that that has the same material strength. So all it, you want all the whole take on it as well, right? I, I don't want to do that. Okay. I think that'll make it too heavy. I, I really want propulsion performance. Let's put this, this photovoltaic somewhere else. Somebody will come along, prove me wrong, I'm fine. If you've got a better idea, I'm all ears, okay? okay? But right now, I'm looking at trying to do that separately. We're just not there with the materials yet. Now, there are a lot of people making these carbon fiber substrates, and I'm running out of time, but uh, there's a lot of good ideas in, in composites and lightweight polymers, but we just don't have them yet. Well, yeah, yeah, is this one area where carbon nanotubes could possibly help? Yes. In fact, uh, if, if Google graphene, and graphene's an incredible material, and it will make a great sail substrate. Question is, is the, is the thrust always radial to the sun? No, it's not. Um, at the beginning of my talk, uh, I talked about how you can tip and tilt the sail and, and change the angle with which the light reflects, and that changes the force vector on the sail, and you can use it to accelerate or decelerate in your orbit. Um, for these interstellar trajectories, we'd actually spiral in very close to the sun, think inside the orbit of Mercury, where the sunlight is a lot stronger to give it a really big kick to go outward. Um, let me just, uh, the, I already said this, this is why we're doing it. I want to sneak up on interstellar travel, and I want to use solar sails to get there. So let me, let me take questions, and then I'll, uh, then I'll break. So yeah, you had a question. Yeah, about how much mass uh, from solar wind particles will sail pick up? We've looked at that. Uh, what it'll, solar wind, and, and don't be confused, sails do not sail the solar wind. There are technologies we're looking at that would sail the solar wind, but it's not a solar sail. <laughs> solar sails use sunlight, okay? The solar wind is the particle radiation from the sun. Instead of light, it's protons, electrons, helium atoms. Mostly that's coming from the sun. And this is streaming out into the solar system all the time. We really won't pick up much of a kick from that. Most of what they're going to do is either pass through or give us a voltage on the front of the sail. And it's, going to, it's called sail charging. And we have to be careful because it's a big conductor. The backside is an insulator. We have to be careful that we don't get differential charge buildup where it actually arcs through and burns through the sail. So we're actually designing the sail to have a, a, have a lot of conduction paths between it and the spacecraft so the charging doesn't affect the voltage of the spacecraft. Static or current? Mostly static. You get a little bit of current, maybe, in some places. But even static, you have to worry about because oh, yeah. it, it wreaks heck with your, your boards. I mean, it's really nasty. We're computer guys. We yeah, 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 yeah. So yeah. Yeah, you have to clip on yeah. and do all your stuff. So <laughs> we, we have to uh, we have to worry about that, and that's part of the design process. It's something that we can solve with good engineering. And if we have a static charge problem, we didn't do our homework because we know how to deal with it. Yeah. Other questions? Can you give a just a really quick description of your project tether? talking about? Oh my, no, I can't. Uh, <laughs> it's a whole hour talk I've got. Uh, uh, real quickly, you guys are ele electrical types. You know that a current flowing through a wire produces a magnetic field, all right? You know the earth has a magnetic field. I'm a propellantless propulsion guy. I like taking advantage of what nature's given us. I have a book called Living Off the Land in Space, which is all about that. Instead of taking stuff with us, let's use what nature's already done and use it. Well, if the earth is a big bar magnet, and I fly a magnet in Earth orbit. What happens when you take the two north poles of a magnet? They repel. 
It's a propulsion system. <laughs> so the Tether project, and, I, and uh, we flew some of these in the US. I was a co-investigator on a Japanese flight in 2011 where we demonstrated this. And you basically flow a current through a wire. It interacts with the Earth's magnetic field, and you can move the spacecraft around that's attached to the wire with no fuel. Okay? And you can do this indefinitely in Earth orbit. It won't work in deep space because you're away from the Earth's magnetic field and ionosphere. But in planetary ionospheres, it is another way to do propellantless propulsion. And oh, by the way, if you, want, if you use a solar sail embedded with electrodynamic tethers in it, you can go from Earth to Jupiter, right. solar sail. Jupiter has one heck of a magnetic field and magnetosphere. Yeah. You can capture at Jupiter electrodynamically with the tether and maneuver around all of the moons at Jupiter with the wires in your sail and not use a single ounce of propellant on the entire mission. Okay? So I have to ask people, why are we still fooling around with rockets? Because they're cool. Well, they are cool. But <laughs> they're forgetting off the ground. Once we get in space, let's use what nature's already put for us. It's efficient. Let's use it and take advantage of it. And that's kind of my preaching for that. I probably have time for one more question. And then uh, I'll take that and then I'll be wrapping up. Yes, sir. How about the uh, spider silk for your tether? Um, I, I don't know if I seriously looked at, at that. Um, it's four times stronger than Kevlar. Is it, is it, we, we need a conducting wire, and I'm not sure about the conductivity properties of all that. I have no idea. If that were needed, it probably would be engineered in. Yeah. I'll, I'll, I can look into that. Um, I, I don't know that we seriously looked at that. We've looked at mostly man-made materials. That might be worth doing. Uh, the materials for the tethers are, are pretty far along. And again, I, 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 next year, if you have no freak neck, I'll come give a whole talk about using tethers uh, in space. Because I, I'm, I'm very bullish on that, but they kind of stalled out a little bit in terms of, of funding for that. Uh, sales have caught on, and I'm really busy with that. But uh, there are still a pretty active uh, tether community out there. Um, and this sale. Uh, tether thing. I'm real pleased to say I've actually got the intellectual property of that. I, uh, I patented that. It's one of the few patents I have. So um, with that, I better wrap up because I know there's probably another speaker. Thank you. If you're interested in any of my books, uh, my friend Johan has them back there for sale. And I'll be glad to answer any questions. And I have business cards with all my electronic contact information. I'd love to hear from folks. Ideas like the spider silk. If you have some idea for your world for communications or anything like that, as long as it's not a perpetual motion machine, I would love to hear from you. So thank you very much.